Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to look at the formation of a muscle waste product called creatinine, which we're going to see is formed from creatine, and then we're going to look at how it's excreted from the body. And it turns out it's going to be excreted through the kidneys. First of all, let's look and see how creatinine is formed from creatine. So particularly in skeletal muscle, this reaction of creatine kinase is very, very important. So creatine can be reversibly phosphorylated to make creatine phosphate. And the phosphate on this new creatine phosphate is going to come from ATP. And so really I should write creatine plus ATP can be converted into creatine phosphate plus ADP. Okay. And so at the onset of exercise, we have a readily available storage form of that, eight, that phosphate, which can then be uh, transferred back to ADP to make ATP, so we can generate ATP very, very quickly in the skeletal muscle, which is going to be important during high-intensity exercise. And this molecule that I have shown up here, this is actually creatine phosphate. The creatine component is really just everything over here up through this nitrogen right here that's labeled number six. This phosphate is the phosphate that comes from ATP. So this is creatine phosphate. Now, creatine phosphate can either be used to make ATP really quickly, and that's by the reverse reaction of creatine kinase going from right to left, or it can spontaneously degrade. And this is going to occur non-enzymatically. I have written here it's a non-enzymatic cyclization. And what happens is, is you get this molecule down here, which is creatinine. Creatinine, which thus the title here, is the degradation product of creatine phosphate. Okay? And so what's going to happen is we have water, a watery medium right here. And one of these molecules of water can actually attack the phosphate right here. It's this nitrogen phosphorus bond is a high energy bond. So water can attack, and what can essentially happen is an electronic rearrangement. These electrons between the nitrogen and the phosphorus move over here. That's going to break the pi bond between this carbon number 4 and nitrogen number 5, and these electrons will then go and attack position 1, which is a carbon. And presumably we have a hydronium right here. This is actually an H plus that's been hydrated. And then these electrons can come out and snag this hydrogen or proton, but what that ultimately does is it creates a bond between position number five right here, which is this nitrogen, and position number one, which is this carbon. Now if we think about it, we should have a five-membered ring because within the ring there will be five atoms. Position one, which is a carbon, that will actually have a carbonyl on it. Position two is just a carbon. Position three is a methylated nitrogen. Position four is gonna have two nitrogens bound, and then position five, which is this nitrogen, will be bound to this carbon one. And that's precisely what we see right here. So this molecule is one form of creatinine. Um, it's worth mentioning that creatinine can actually tautomerize, in which case the double bond will shift from positions four and six to be between four and five. But these are two equally valid forms, or tautomers, of creatinine. Now, creatinine is not really degraded any further in humans. Rather, the creatinine is going to exit the muscle cell, which is where it normally forms, by means of passive transport. It's just going to be able to diffuse through the membrane. Uh, the fact that it's cyclic now and it lost the phosphate actually renders it fairly hydrophobic. And particularly due to this methyl group right here, um, it's going to be able to cross the membrane by passive transport, and it will move into the blood and it will travel in the blood until it reaches the renal system, the kidneys. We see a schematic right here that's showing exactly what happens. So here's the blood side over here on the left. Creatinine will actually be transported into uh, the proximal tubule of the nephron through a transporter, SLC22A2, and this is actually going to be a form of, of um, antiportation because creatinine is coming in and presumably there's another molecule such as protons being pumped out. Okay? But once creatinine is in here, there's a variety of other transporters that will actually be able to move creatinine into the urine. Three of these are going to be primary active transporters. We see all three of these top ones utilize ATP directly. 
These other ones are going to be secondary active transporters, which are going to antiport protons into the proximal tubule, while the creatinine that's in here is going to be pumped into the urine. So it's going to undergo active tubular secretion into the urine. And so then creatinine is just going to be eliminated in the urine. So this is a fairly straightforward process. There is only one other thing I wanted to mention about this process that's also quite important. Creatine phosphate, as you probably know, is more important in high-intensity exercises, particularly the beginning phases, such as if you sprint or you're doing powerlifting. Creatine phosphate becomes a very important source of ATP for the exercising skeletal muscle. What we also know is that during high-intensity exercise, the pH of the muscle cell is going to drop due to the accumulation of hydrogen ions. So the fact that this last mechanistic step of the cyclization requires an H3O plus, or acid, the more acid you have, the faster the rate of the cyclization. Okay? So the higher the intensity of the exercise, the lower the pH of the muscle cell, and the faster the rate of the cyclization. So the important thing is, as you start to get more and more acidic inside the muscle cell, you're going to have more and more creatinine formation. Okay? So anytime you have a cell that is generating ATP at a really high rate, as in high intensity, and it's building up acid, you're going to have more creatinine formation. Okay? What we also find is in cases where somebody has an MI, a myocardial infarction, or a heart attack, the heart cells have lost oxygen supply probably due to a coronary blockage. And so those muscle cells inside the heart, the cardiac muscle tissue, is now forced to run anaerobically. And running anaerobically, the heart cell is going to rely more on creatine phosphate. And so when someone has a heart attack, essentially their heart cell lyses and releases a bunch of contents into the blood, one of which is creatinine, which is the degradation product of creatine kinase. And so when somebody has a heart attack, one of the ways that they diagnose it is actually with eleva elevated levels of creatinine in the blood. They will also look for creatine kinase since the heart cell ruptures and releases that enzyme. But they can also look for creatinine as a diagnostic tool. Okay? Hopefully this video made sense and gave you some good information. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.